isn't what what is uh, growing, what is uh, crib. And, and is that allowed in your specific area? It's, it's detailed in this document. We use that as a consultant for every work permit application that comes in. And very handy reference material. What do you do if you're uninsured? If your project will require a work permit, contact them in our Sometimes we're a little hard to get a hold of, but we will get back to you. Uh, you can submit a work permit application. You can just mail one in. I've got some copies here I'll leave behind. Uh, you can call the MNR, try and get a hold of us. Uh, if it's a simple project, it might just be a phone conversation. Say yes, you need to do an application. No, uh, that project doesn't require a work permit. Or you can email the work permit tech, and you just include a little bit of a project sketch, a uh, little <coughs> description. We need the location so that we can apply the shoreline management plan to it and the description to know what's involved. So these are the questions that keep coming up and the rules around have changed a little bit, so a little explanation. The high water mark isn't technically the high water mark anymore. What everybody considers the high water mark is now actually referred to as the line of seasonal inundation. The high water mark is <laughs> only in areas Tidal fluctuation, which is out on the island here because we have a little bit of tidal flux uh, with the, the North Channel and everything. But now the line of seasonal inundation is the area of shoreline that can reasonably be assumed to submerge during spring flooding. Uh, the MNR generally uses shoreline vegetation to determine this line, and anything below this line is considered lake bed. If you have me out to your property to do a shoreline inspection, the first thing I'm going to do is walk out under the beach, walk down to the water walk up to the tree line and then walk and I look for the line where the vegetation on this side is mostly aquatic and the vegetation on this side is mostly terrestrial. That's my guide. That's, uh, that's an explanation for the line there, the vegetation line there. The shoreline road allowance, which is another issue that uh, keeps coming up, especially with the water going down. It's a strip of land reserved around lakes for the purposes of future road construction. Uh, it can grow and shrink depending on the current water levels. The inland road allowance survey line is fixed, which means the lower end of your property, if you have a shoreline road allowance in front of yours, yours does never, will never grow. That's the line, it will always be right there. But the outer line of that, the water's edge of the shoreline road allowance, when the water goes down, the shoreline road allowance expands out. If the water comes up, the shoreline road allowance shrinks a little. So depending on where your project's situated, you might need a work permit, or it might be in the middle of the shoreline road allowance. If in question at all, always contact the MNR. You don't want to be found later doing something you shouldn't be. Uh, the municipality provides comment for the shoreline road allowance. And in an unorganized township, the shoreline road allowance, uh, the shoreline road allowances are administered by the MNR, and a work permit is required which provides the kind of comments for the project. So this is my little sketch. Lot, uh, the first lot there is lot four. It's the surveyed lot lines. At the time that that lot was surveyed, that would be the area that was the road allowance. That is the lot. So five or 10 years go by and the water goes down. The lot stays the same size, but now the road allowance is almost double. And let's say another 15, 20 years goes by, the water comes back up, as we all hope it's going up. The shoreline road allowance is now shrunk. So now it's a third or a half of what it was originally surveyed at. But the property has always remained the same size. So sediment control, and uh, we talked about the sediment control plan being required for your work permit. Sediment control is required any time there's a possibility of releasing or disturbing sediments into the water. So basically any time you touch the bottom of the lake, you're going to make a little cloud or something, it should be contained. If it's severe enough, it definitely should be contained. Sometimes in minor cases, you might not need it. When in doubt, call the MNR. Um, it's required even if the work permit is not. Uh, if you remember, one of the exceptions to needing a work permit was if you're making a crib under 15 square meters. Even though you don't need a work permit, if you're disturbing the bottom, then you should have one in place. Uh, releasing sediments into the water is actually uh, a deleterious sentence. Um, what's the, the, the law? Fisheries Act. It's under the Fisheries Act, sorry. And it's, it's a findable offense. Depends. <laughs> Find usually scale to the severity of the impact. So throw a little 
the silk screen up, and you're in compliance again, no problems. It's <coughs> sediment control is always dependent on the size of the project. If you're putting one crib in, you need a little bit of sediment to the plant. If you're building a huge marina structure out in big water, well, then your sediment containment plant is going to be a little more substantial than I am going to put a sediment or silk screen around this area. There will be more detail involved. And it normally takes the form of a silk screen or a gas for small projects. A dredge disposal plan is required any time material is removed from the lake bed. It states this disposal site, the location, the method of transport, and the method of stabilization and isolation. Again, it could be a sentence, could be a paragraph. I, Joe Blow, am dredging my harbor. I will take set dredging and deposit it on my property at the X. I'm going to grade this level and plant it with some grass. So you told me how you were going to stabilize it, told me where it was, everything I needed to know all in one sentence. If it's a huge project like a, like a harbor creation, a lot more dredging to dispose of, you're going to have a more substantial plan. Dredging also may require testing by the MOE to verify that there are no toxins present. And the best example around here is anything in the Spanish River, because of all the industrialized uh, operations that have happened for two or three hundred years now. There's lots of uh, toxins, furons, and dioxins, and all kinds of nasty things buried in the sediment layers. When you dredge down, <coughs> you are transporting that toxin and putting it wherever you were dis disposing of your dredging. Uh, before you start a project like that, you send your sediment in to the MOE for testing, and they grade it, and then they kind of have guidelines on where you can dispose of it based on its contamination. <coughs> we all have our finger in the pot on where that would be on the pool for what that would be disposed of. In water timing restrictions, that's a condition for any project where you require a work permit, and uh, even if you don't require a work permit, still should abide by these and these can happen. Uh, it restricts the time of the year that work can happen in the water. It's employed to protect fish during the sensitive times of their life cycle, like uh, when they stage the spawn, the spawn uh, after the fish hatch out, and where the little fishes turn into big fishes, the nursery habitat. And it's based on the fish species present in the body of water. So if, uh, if you have trout and bass and uh, walleye in your lake, you have a very, very narrow timing window because you have both warm and cold water species. Warm water species spawn in the spring and cold water species spawn in the fall. You can't affect either of those spawns. So the only safe time to work is basically right in the middle of the summertime after the spring spawners and before the fall spawners. So you have a two-month window. When a work permit is not required, uh, it's for the creation of small trip structures, installation of private water lines, Clearing of shoreline access path. A work permit is not always required for these actions. This does not alleviate the performance responsibility to follow applicable <coughs> legislation or from acting in an environmentally responsible manner. Crib creation uh, <coughs> without a work permit must occupy less than 15 square meters, must be installed during the timing windows. Still, silt control should be a consideration. Uh, all rock filter cribs must be obtained from an inland source. There's no picking rocks off the shore. That's removing fish habitat. Destruction of fish habitat, that's a final offense. So inland source, nice and clean. Uh, by clean, I mean no, no fine debris, no covered in clay. Uh, usually they call it wash stone. If one solid structure, it may be considered a groin and may or may not require an engineer an engineer coastal engineering study. Get into a lot of gray area there. Uh, basically, we prefer a one and two because you have a lot of flow through. So you're not really disrupting all of the shoreline processes or the waves move sediment down the shore. You're not really impacting it. When you get into your, your fixed structures, and this one especially because it's straight along, this one here is going to allow sediment to collect on the lee side of it. So you're going to end up with a mucky, swampy area on that side. It could go out far enough that it's an instruction to transportation, so you would require transport panders. You might require transport panders in Google. Mainly, from our point of view, you are disrupting shoreline processes. Uh, this does not allow the wave to move the sand grain from this side to this side. So it's going to pile up on one side or the other. It affects the natural shoreline composition that was there. So one and two are our favorites. Three, not 
bad or we hope not. <laughs> Installation of a private water line should be done in the in water timing window. Will employ some form of silt mitigation measure. Uh, always requires a silt screen. You're digging down into the dirt. <coughs> Marcel Gochi, I'm a counselor with the municipality. Uh, regarding uh, contacting MNR, would you say that uh, using email would be the better avenue? 
I prefer email myself. Uh, some people prefer the phone. The, the reason yeah, I'm yeah. asking is because, all, you, like everybody's saying, it's really hard to get a hold of M&R, but usually by email you can. I do. That's why I prefer email. Okay. Uh, there's always a written record of it, and the computer read sessions have been answered. Thank you very much. What's the address? <laughs> uh, I think you might, but I'm not going to be there shortly. I hope to be back in the fall. Uh, Ken Hansen is available. His number is available at the front desk. Yeah. And for phone or email? Either one. Either one? I, I have a few cards if, if people want to get up. My name is Martin Nussen. I have a question. I have seen water lines put in in the winter in shallow bays where the ice is cut with a chainsaw to make a trench and then the backhoe operates on the ice to trench it out. Now how is all that handled? That, I believe, would require a work permit. Not really. That would be the first one. Again, how do you deal with the silt net? Then well, that's where the whole time windows come in. Sometimes the timing windows depends where, where they're doing it. They should be out there working in the wintertime because that's a great old fish habitat timing windows too. Supposing the timing is okay, what about the silt net though? That is actually easier to put one up in the wintertime and easier to maintain. In the, in the summertime, you've got waves and current and a lot of things to displace it. In the wintertime, you wait for four or five inches of ice to be over the area that you're going to be working in. You go out, you chop out your area, and then you lay your silt screen out. And all you need is to weight down the bottom, and then you bring the top of the silt screen out and lay it on the ice. And you can freeze it in or peg it down. But in the wintertime, there is no way to lift your silt screen up. There's very little current moving up and down the shore to actually move the silt curtain off the place. So uh, it's, it's actually a little better. You can uh, be approved to work in the wintertime to install that line, but you would definitely work from it then because you are working out of tiny windows, and it's not guaranteed to be approved. It would be very dependent on your location. Uh, the biologist would need to sign off on it, and there may be some additional conditions to apply to your work permit. It must be a little tricky to put the silt net in because if you're going to put a light backhoe on there, <clears throat> you haven't got much spread between the tracks. So if you go outside that, well, you're going to weaken the upper... Generally, your, your equipment is outside the silt screen. Your pardon? Generally, you'd have your equipment working outside the silt screen in that instance. You'd be just off to the side and kind of digging on, on a little bit of an angle into your, into your trough. Do you, do you know, am I explaining that right? Yeah. Like normally, I think you're thinking you drive your backhoe up and then you start digging your way back, right? Yeah. Well, in the wintertime, you have to be just a little off to the side. You might even be working perpendicular to it and just trying to line a, a majority trench up. You don't get a straight line in the wintertime because of working off to the side like okay. that. But you also get to restrict the area that you're containing the silt screen as long as it's enough for your bucket to operate. Like, a, you don't have to enclose your equipment in it. Yeah, okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Have, have I answered your question? Can I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Sure. Um, well, certainly. Um, I have some people approaching me with water line problems, and what we have is about 60 feet of one and a half or two feet of water, and they want to dig it down. So, besides the silt screen, you're seeing the machinery tank into the water past the high water mark? Or the right. Thing. So, they only reach about eight feet of the machine.
and I hired a contractor to put it in, and he came in and got the, I got a permit, and they put the, the netting out, whatever they had to do. Well, what's happened now? The water's gone down so far, I've got a, at least 80 to 100 more feet of shoreline than I had when I originally bought 35 years ago. And um, what has happened, um, when it was buried, I had it buried also inside another round pipe, so if I ever had to get my water line out, I'd be able to pull it out without having any problem, and I could fix wherever I had, which was a good way to do it. But what has happened now, the water has gone down so far that I question that it's probably not far enough underground that it's going to freeze, even though I have a heat coil in it as well, but I keep losing the heat coil every year. When the ice comes in, the ice builds up and comes in, and as it comes in, it doubles up and doubles up and doubles up. Then it grabs a hold of the water line down there and just tears it all to pieces so I lose the heat coil and the water line that's you know, caught with the ice. So I'm going to have them come back. I'm going to get a permit, have them come back in again this year, and they're going to put the screen around it. And I guess they're going to have to bury it back farther so it's deep enough that it's not going to freeze. But when they go out into the water, I'm going to have to go out again like we did originally and put the screen out and do it. But he's suggesting that they use a galvanized pipe, which will stay down better. This gentleman probably knows better. And uh, with the foot valve in the end, that's what they've been doing down in there. And they seem to be standing up to the ice. Where, where the water line is more buoyant no matter how you try to hold it down. And uh, the ice grabs a hold of it and tears it out. Do you have any comment on that? I can't really assess the tear. The, con the, con the contractors you're working with would know the best mechanism. Yes, well, that's what he suggested. That's the only, I don't know what they say. That's the only one that's been standing up out there, so I'm going to have them back. So I'm, even though I'm... So I need the same permits and everything that I had before. How far in the water are you? Can you uh, access the end of your pipe? Well, I'm pr uh, he's probably going to have to go another few more feet because he has to have that part down deep enough yep. that the ice is not going to catch it. From there, then on out, I've got no problem because, of course, it's, there's enough water that the ice don't go all the way down. So as long as you're, the equipment you're using Boy, oh, he'll use it. He'll probably use a small backhoe. That's what he originally did, and it reaches out. And, uh, Do you think have to take and I, I'm probably not going to continue <coughs> to put that that pipe that I had in before. I thought I would continue with that, and he said, "Really, there's no use because what I did um, didn't accomplish what I thought it would." So the casing is not holding the pipe down either. Beg your pardon? The casing, like you have your water line within the casing, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I, only so far out. I mean, yeah. you can't go on, a, um, like I want to be out about a good 100 to 150 feet because if the water gets rough, then uh, the water's a mess. But that line that's out there, of course, it's it's not covered or nothing. But uh, the way they're doing it now, they're, they're using a, a reinforcing rod as well with, the, with it, a uh, galvanized reinforcing rod that helps hold this line down.
municipality for the shoreline road allowance if that's <coughs> crown, if you're next to crown land and you inspect it. Uh, and a map to the location so that anybody who might have to go to your site for an inspection can find it. Not everybody lives in Escanola or Sudbury. Some folks will be coming from Toronto and Ottawa and Manitou and Ireland. It's just another way to get on the map. So they need to be able to follow the line and get right to your spot. As a rule of thumb, for any work permit application, include as much information and detail as possible. Uh, delays in the approval process occur when more information is required from the applicant, or if not enough information is provided to make suggestions to keep your <coughs> compliance with work permit regulations. And we can only suggest what you could do to stay in line with current regulations. We're, we can't really tell you this is the best way for you to do this project because we assume liability. So provide as much as you can, suggest anything you want. We will work with you to try and get something that's